So this is the second in a series of programs on international security issues. The presentation today that I gave was called The Revolution in Security Affairs. The thesis of which is that given the array of rapidly uh, advancing technologies and accelerating technology amidst changes in the strategic landscape where you see non-state actors and even individuals now being able to compete with states, that the very notion of security and what we do to provide security for citizens of states is in flux and changing and will continue to change for some time. This is enabled largely by the increase in technology that permits rapid, near real-time or real-time global communication, uh, a much greater array of uh, significant intelligence from social media and monitoring the electromagnetic spectrum and our ability to collect, store, uh, process, and use vast amounts of data far greater than we have ever been able to do before. And this is fundamentally changing the nature of international security, how we provide it, and our ability to provide it. So among uh, some of the things that are changing is there's a much greater transparency. Uh, virtually anyone can access vast amounts of data, whether print, uh, audio, streaming video, uh, of information of all kinds, economic, social, sports, cultural, political. And this data is increasingly available for free or for not much in the way of money or investment of any kind to a greater number of individuals, corporations, universities, militaries, intelligence services. And that fact has created a circumstance where the notion of privacy uh, is virtually non-existent. Um, if there is something someone wants to find out badly enough, they can find out. And increasingly, the value of open source intelligence by mining this vast amount of data available on the internet uh, has supplanted what we used to consider as uh, most important classified military intelligence. Uh, my illustration of this is the tweet that a neighbor of Osama bin Laden sent uh, the night that o bin Laden was killed when he sent a tweet at 1 a.m. in the morning saying, helicopter over Abbottabad, a very rare event. That's as close to real-time intelligence as you're going to get, and virtually everyone has access to it if they're clever enough. In the last 15 years, we've created uh, Facebook, Skype, uh, YouTube, uh, all kinds of social media that didn't exist before. So if you're 15 years old, you've grown up with all of this. This is routine. It, it's a part of your life. You think nothing of it. For those who are older, uh, th this represents a, a sea change in how you uh, collect information, think about it, and use it, and the time in which you use it. Increasingly, we're driven toward doing things instantly, uh, or at least more rapidly than ever before. Uh, we want all the information. We want it now. We want confirmation of receipt of texts, emails, phone calls, and so forth. Uh, that's, that's a total sea change. The generation before this uh, saw that uh, television and 24-hour news cycles and DVDs and CDs were new and novel. Uh, our grandparents had to put up with uh, electricity, radio, television, but what took 40 or 50 years for major technological changes for our grandparents' generation now has occurred in less than 15 with far greater impact, global reach, and almost instantaneous in time. The future is likely to take that, wet it to robotics, and an increasingly 
uh, automated and autonomous uh, set of capabilities in society uh, to make man-machine teaming, man-machine interfaces virtually the norm for almost anything we will do 10 to 20 years from now. We're still finding out what the implications of vastly expanded social media, increased transparency, and sort of ubiquitous global communications might mean not only for individuals, but for companies, universities, uh, governments, uh, and societies, uh, where more and more people share more and more things. Uh, billions of hours of YouTube video, billions of tweets, uh, zettabytes of data being shared. Uh, we really have no sense of what this might mean and how things may progress and unfold in the future. It's very much a real-time experiment in the making. A lot of people don't understand the full consequence or potential consequence of the data they access, put on the internet, or take from it, upload, what they upload and download. Everything that happens on the internet stays. It's there, somewhere, somehow, some way. You, you will not erase this. And uh, that very clever tweet you sent or the uh, nasty zinger of an email with a great one-liner to your boss or to a colleague uh, will come back to haunt you. You just don't understand that that's a reality. So for all the staggering amounts of data that are available on the internet, the reality of what is searchable is something on the order of six or seven percent of the data that is technically available but exists in what's called the dark web. That information is encrypted, proprietary, uh, governmental, military, but it is not readily accessible through Google searches. Uh, and that constitutes far and away the, the greatest portion of the information on the internet. It's just not searchable. Uh, without very sophisticated tools and capabilities. So one of the realities is that, as political philosophy explains it, human beings gave up their natural rights where they could do anything they wanted at any time to anyone, anywhere that they were able in exchange for civil rights for the state. And the state promised to protect them in their person and their property. The first duty of a state is to protect its territory and its citizens. In the 21st century, earlier than 2016, no state in the world is able to make good on that promise. Uh, my proof of this is the tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people who've had their bank accounts raided, their credit cards stolen, their very identity stolen by internet hackers cyber crime, cyber espionage, and it's just proof that the state is no longer able to protect you, to provide you the security that you expected. Uh, and that's true of every state in the world. Uh, cyber crime, cyber espionage, the capacity for cyber warfare literally knows no territorial or national boundaries and could happen virtually any place at any time. There are all sorts of things you can do to protect your online identity and information sharing and transfers, but you can only change passwords with a certain frequency, get rid of cookies on your computer at certain times, and be careful about where you go and the footprints you leave, but you leave digital footprints every time you use a computer. If you want to be absolutely safe in the use of a computer, you turn it off. If the electrons are flowing, somebody has access to avail themselves of what you're doing if they want to. So I guess the, the gist of uh, the presentation and some of the research and work I'm doing suggests that we are well into an era in which uh, the definition and the process of how we seek to protect ourselves 
the defense of the nation, the notion of security, national or international, is very much in flux and it may or may not be possible to provide the level of assurance and protection that citizens once expected from their state, uh, their governments to provide for them. And a large part of protecting uh, the territory and people of a state is no longer strictly a military task. It's a whole of government circumstance in which literally every citizen is or ought to be involved. Mm -hmm.